Hey folks, on a fairly lengthy episode of the Total Soccer Show today, we're going to be talking to Joe Lowry up front. Daryl and I talked to him about all of the different uh, M- MLS conference semifinal matchups that happened, as well as previewing the conference finals still to come. We get into a lot of the nitty gritty, a lot of the individual moments, some of the individual players, and some of the most crazy moments. After that, I talk to Jeff Kasuf of The Equalizer. We get into the NWSL final, which is happening this weekend, and a preview of that, but also the NWSL best 11 list that has come out some controversy there so jeff talks about that plus the impending hire of a certain individual to coach the u.s women's national team more on that later obviously and then a bit about alex morgan's uh, pregnancy and what that might mean for the u.s olympic squad so a very long show lots of great content hopefully you all enjoy but first i wanted to remind you that the holiday season is fast approaching and if you're looking for something different for your significant other why not spice things up by getting them some high-end lingerie from and closed. We are not talking about department store or Victoria's Secret quality. We're talking seriously high-end products and with enclosed size guarantee, their products fit right 98% of the time. Basically, that means enclosed will do all the work, you get all the credit. So go to enclosed.gifts, that's E-N-C-L-O-S-E-D dot G-I-F-T-S, and use the code TOTALSOCCER, all one word, all together at checkout to get $35 off any multi-month order. One more time, that's enclosed.gifts, and the code is TOTALSOCCER for $35 off any multi-month order. If you can't remember that, then there's a link in the show notes, uh, but check them out. We appreciate them sponsoring today's episode. We appreciate you, the listener, listening to today's episode. And with that in mind, let's get to today's episode. Welcome to the Total Sucker Show. My name is Daryl Grove, and I'm joined by one man who loves all his soccer played in a baseball stadium. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. I'm supposed to yes and you, but I refuse. <laughs> I do not enjoy that at all. Uh, I do not know. enjoy that game, nor the camera angle, nor the mesh covering the camera. So you didn't know but me? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> and I'm joined by a man who isn't bothered by 10.48 p.m. Eastern kickoff times because he's on the West Coast. It's Joe Lowry. Hello, Joe. Welcome back. Hey guys, how are you doing today? We're we're good. We I would say we're sleep deprived, but I slept in to catch up after <laughs> after the uh, El Trafico game. Good for you. Oh, not so much very nice for you, yeah. my friend. Did the dogs need walking? Yes, they did. They did. All right. Well, let's start with the game that we didn't review yesterday. It was the NYCFC defensive horror show game where they lost 2-1 at City, City Field, it's called. Mm-hmm. It's spelled C-I-T-I. I believe um, so. City Field to Toronto FC. Two goals from my man. Alejandro Pozzuolo. Mm-hmm. Um, Taylor, what, what did you make of this game? What's your, what's your thoughts uh, from yesterday? Uh, so w- we had them, right? We were ready to go yeah. and then we didn't do it. I was pretty confused by this game because it seemed like Toronto kind of took it to NYCFC. They did the high press. They caused problems for them all over the place. Yeah. And, and actually, Lalas had a great point on the, bro- on the broadcast, right? A great tactical point about how essentially NYCFC couldn't play out of it. Right. Yeah. A- and then it seemed like, like Toronto kind of shifted into, okay, we're going to see this out. We got to like kind of make sure we, we finish this 1-0. And they started doing that, like the maybe basically at the start of the second half, but like inside the first like ten minutes of the second half, they're already kind of being defensive. So when NYCFC equalize, it felt for all the world to me like, okay, this is it. NYCFC are going to win two to one, maybe three to one. The momentum is completely shifted. Toronto somehow weather that storm, fight back, get the the late penalty, draw that late penalty, and that's kind of where I wanted to start with Joe. Actually, is wondering if Joe saw it that same way, or if he was less surprised that Toronto were able to turn things around. No, I I did see it the same way. I thought this game was reminiscent, weirdly, this is an odd comparison to make, but of that RSL Portland game in the first round with some of the momentum swings that we saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you, I think you guys kind of nailed it there. Toronto came out, and, and as you were talking about Alexi Lawless talking on the broadcast, they did press NYCFC's buildup, which is something that I didn't think they'd be able to do. I thought NYCFC would be able to play through them and get some quality attacking chances from their possession. But but no, Toronto came out, and they pressed man for man. They eliminated Alex Ring and Maxi Morales, really, from New York City's buildup, and that, that gave them momentum to start. Even though they didn't grab a goal in that first half, they came out at the start of the second half and, and got one off of a pretty you know tough mistake from NYCFC's backline. But they, they came back we'll and they were on top of that. 
Oh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Then then NYCFC swung the momentum back in their favor. Torrent made a, a nice tactical formation change at halftime, adjusting his shape a little bit. And it oh, looked what like did, they were going to run he, away with it. So what did he do? Because I'm guessing that's the big change that allowed them to... Because in case anyone didn't see it, NYCFC tried to play out of the back. Toronto pressed high. NYCFC eventually just like went kind of longish. And then the Toronto midfield won basically everything, right? They ate it all up. So NYCFC couldn't go anywhere. What's, it, what's the tactical change that allowed NYCFC to not get pressed to death? So at halftime, Torrent came out and changed from the 4-2-3-1 that they'd started in where he had Keaton Parks and Alex Ring as a double pivot. Yeah. And Maxi Morales a little bit higher. He changed to a 4-4-2 diamond, which allowed the, that midfield, number one, to, to be a little bit better connected. There was less of a gap between the double pivot and the attack. And it also allowed them to just simply get more bodies in midfield, right. which helped NYCFC play out of that pressure a little bit better. And then as Maybe well, Maybe Craig was watching and learning. I mean, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> it would be nice, though, if he was watching for Keaton Parks. Um, I'd be a fan of that. Taylor but, mentioned you were a fan of Keaton Parks in this game, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah, I did. Um, um, yeah, Drew, I was wondering like, if you are surprised Keaton Parks hasn't gotten more looks with the national team because it seems like he's good in possession, was inclined to turn and play forward. It seems like that's a thing we've been missing. I think his skill set would be a fun one to try out in this in the system that Berhalter is running or that he's trying to run. I'm not necessarily surprised that he hasn't been in as much this year because it's you know coming over from Benfica. It took him a while to get established in the lineup in New York. And now it, he kind of did get acclimated, but it's only really his first full professional season where he's gotten real minutes outside of some time for Benfica B here and there. So I'm not necessarily surprised, but if he continues, if he ends up in New York City permanently, I believe he's on loan right now. If he ends up there permanently and starts playing more consistently next year, get him in there, absolutely. Get him in there. And, and so flipping it around, though, since we've talked a decent amount about NYCFC, we should talk a bit about Toronto. Is this a thing you think they're capable of replicating in the Eastern Conference final, or will they have to adjust their, adjust their game plan again and maybe hope that Omar Gonzalez, Josie Altador are closer to being fit, if not fully fit, uh, for that game? I think they're capable of playing the same way. I, I was a little bit surprised that they did, but... Now that we've seen it work against, I mean, realistically, the best and most consistent team in the Eastern Conference, I see no reason why they couldn't match up with Atlanta a little bit. Although, to be fair, Atlanta won't play the same way that allowed Toronto to, to frustrate NYCFC. So I'm not sure we'll see the exact same thing. But sure, it's totally possible if we do see Atlanta try to build up a little bit, Toronto could press them, win the ball, and then use their own possession to, to create attacking chances. Before we move on, we've got to talk goals, right? I want to talk, especially first, we'll do it in order, about that Pozuelo goal from the, I'm going to say two defensive mistakes from NYCFC. I'm blaming equally Ring and Cheneau for ill-advised headers. Is that fair, like 50-50 blame? Taylor or Taylor or Joe? I, I mean, I would blame Cheneau more than I would blame Ring. I really? Think Ring is just trying to get ahead to it, in my opinion. Cheneau, like is trying to be clever, trying to flick it up in the air for Sean Johnson to come out and collect. I think he doesn't know where he is in relation to Sean Johnson. I think he doesn't know where Sean Johnson is in relation to him. Yeah, he so, didn't look, right? He didn't yeah. look backwards. No, so just to kind of go for that and expect it to come off definitely leaves his team in a bit of trouble. And then Pozuelo latching onto the end of it and finishing makes them even more in trouble. I think there's a that, bit of blame for Ring because he's. I think he's trying to head it back to Johnson and just gets, what, maybe 50% of the power he expected, which is why it ends up with Cheneau instead. Joe, what do you I, see? I think we can just go ahead and throw some blame around to everybody in that sequence because <laughs> it's just a general lack of communication, right? If Sean Johnson, and maybe he did yacht and we, we just couldn't see it, but if that communication starts a little bit sooner, then they probably aren't dealing with those you know, ill-advised headers in the first place. So you know, if that, if that sequence doesn't happen, then we're looking at a totally different game. And NYCFC realistically probably do come out of that second half as the winner. So, yeah, I'm willing to throw out some blame to, to pretty much everybody involved in that little trio of defenders. And then the NYCFC equaliser scored by the Cooligans lawyer, Ismail Tajuri <laughs> Shahadi. Um, Taylor and I had a bit of a debate, which he very much won in the studio, of was Maxi Morales looking for Tajuri Shahadi or was he just crossing it blind into the box. Where, where do you go on that, Joe? Oh, I, I wish I was there for that debate because honestly, I, I don't know. I'd have to rewatch it a number of times to tell. It was a nice ball, whether, whether he meant it or not. It was dangerous to deal with. But what do you guys think about that sequence? Uh, I think Daryl wanted it to be the case that he picked, a, picked up his head and decided <laughs> that Tishri Shadi was like, going to be crashing that back post. I, think, I thought I saw it. Yeah, I think he's aware that there are just bodies in the box. I think he's aiming, hoping somebody gets, gets ahead to it. But it is like that sort of well-hit cross that's going to hang up in the air, cause problems for defenders, but not hang up so much that everybody's able to adjust. So I think he's just sort of backing that. If I put this in the box, somebody will hopefully be there to meet it. And he ended up being 
being proven correct. And the guy we ended up putting more blame on was Jonathan Osorio mm. because he was aware that Tajiri Shradi was at the back post, but then weirdly got distracted uh, by a player at the top of the box, right? And yeah. let Tajiri Shradi go. Yes. Yeah, um, and, and that player was marked by Michael Bradley. I can't remember who yeah. it was for New York. Uh, but that was, that was, oh, it was Matrita, I think it was, who was sitting at the top. And Bradley yeah, had I him. So. I think Osorio got a little bit nervous. And in the end, you've got a wide open player at the back post. So not great defensive work from Toronto. I don't think they can give as many defensive lapses when it comes to defending the likes of Jose Martinez in Atlanta. Then again, as long as they don't do what uh, Matarita did, then yeah. I think they'll be okay. So the reason I've been playing the blame game in the uh, analysis of these goals is I've been building up to the man who is... Ultimately to blame, just ask, Ma- ask Maxi Mor- Mor- Morales, mm-hmm. it's Matarita with that horrible, just I don't know what he was thinking tackle on Laria, who's a player I've become more familiar with after he, he helped Canada beat the United States. Um, Joe, is there any tactical analysis to give of Matarita's uh, tackle foul in the box? Or is this just madness? It's just playoff madness. I feel like you know the answer to this question before. Well, no, I'm that. hoping there's some reason why it would make what, sense why to go to Grant. Why a horrible tackle? Yeah, on, on, a, <laughs> on Larry's... A, a tactical analysis of Larry's why a horrible tackle day. was horrible. You don't know how good Joe is. He might have some brilliant points. <laughs> I, okay, I, now I feel you know even better about this, but I do have something more general to say about this, this sequence. Okay. The tackle, not on the tackle at all. I don't... That decision <laughs> was super questionable. But in the build-up to that play... As Toronto were kind of getting back into it a little bit, New York City FC had equalized. They were pushing numbers forward as well. So there were there were gaps in the left side of New York City FC's defense. It was pretty much just Matarita, Morales, and Matriza defending on that side. And so Toronto saw that, and they kind of licked mm. their lips a little bit. Three times uh, from around the 80th minute into that, that tackle from Matarita in the box. Three times Toronto played down that side and had a legitimate chance. And so that last time that Matarita brought Luria down in the box, that was sort of just the culmination of Toronto's attacking game plan. And yeah, the, the decision was poor and it didn't reflect well on on their play as a whole. But it, there definitely was sort of a larger plot leading up to that that point and eventually the Pozuelo Panenka. So Greg Vanni's uh, tactical decisions were as sharp as his scarf selection. <laughs> I'd say so. I think the, the scarf looked great and his tactics played out pretty well too. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to add on this game from Taylor or Joe? Nothing from this one. Nothing from this Other one. Other than that, I'm really happy that although I'm, I uh, am sad for NYCFC fans, I know they were excited to go deep into this postseason to not have a, another game played at that angle. It legitimately like made me a little bit dizzy when I first tuned in because I wasn't ready <laughs> for how close it was going to be, how low it was going to be, and how much behind uh, the baseball netting it was going to be. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I won't miss that so much. So actually, I had a thought about this, which is that even though it was still a baseball stadium mm-hmm. um, in the five boroughs, and even though they had the dimensions the same as Yankee Stadium— I think NYCFC are still at a disadvantage here where they're essentially not getting a home game when they've earned a home game, right? They don't, just because they drape some sky blue uh, tarpaulin over various things at City Field, they, I'm guessing the NYCFC players were not as comfortable at City Field as they would have been at the more familiar Yankee Stadium. Why do you say that? Because it's just not their home field, right? There's, there's definitely just a comfort about having your home field. Like, you know, the dressing room, you know, like the various bumps on the field. There's just a comfort to being at home. Yeah, am I reading too much into that, do you think? I mean, I don't know, because, like, like, I feel like they probably don't even think of Yankee Stadium as their home, because it's not. <laughs> well, it's they the outfield every other for Saturday, the Yankees. Right? Like, I don't know. It, it's it's hard for me to really know how much of a factor that was, because it's already, it's not like they went from playing on a normal size field to, like, a yeah. tiny field, the way they kind of already do. Like, they already do that. So I, I don't, like, I take your point, and I understand why you would say that, but... I also think maybe in contrast to say like if Toronto had to play somewhere else because BMO Field was taken that day, I think that's like probably going to be a way bigger issue for them than maybe it, it would have been for NYCFC. That said, they did lose, so who knows? Yeah. So build your own stadium, and then you never have to worry about these things. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> well, a team that didn't build their own stadium nope. but does a really good job sharing one. Yep. Seattle Sounders uh, later uh, Wednesday night hosted Rail Salt Lake. This finished two nil to the Seattle Sounders. First goal was um, a goal I really enjoyed, the near post header from Gustav Svensson. Why did you enjoy it? I just like the, um, because it seems like Rail Salt Lake had all kinds of bodies in the box. I think Mm -hmm. we figured out it was probably a zonal marking system. So there weren't really gaps. So they just went for this like tiny sliver of opportunity that really relies a lot on Svensson getting his angles and his timing right. I also say because I've tried that header multiple times and never, Mm. ever, ever got it on frame. Well, I think uh, the key thing there is that they also have tried that multiple times from what I read and I think even heard in the commentary, that was a corner routine that they have uh, utilized against zonal marking teams in the past. Mm. So I think it's one that they probably have a few 
few uh, reps with Joe. Is that a thing you've seen from Seattle? Are they particularly good on set pieces, or was this just a, a lovely flick from Gustav Svensson and some poor positioning from RSL? They absolutely have – the Sounders absolutely have you know the bodies and the, the physical presence in the box – to be an above average team on set pieces. And then again, you look at the design of that set piece, kind of as, as you both just already broke down the near post run and the, the fantastic angle on the finish. All of those factors, especially in the postseason, are going to make, you know, Seattle just a little bit more dangerous because they have some of that ability to attack from set pieces. So as they continue to move forward and, and now have this matchup in the, in the Western Conference final, I think that's going to be something to keep an eye on, especially against an LAFC team that, as we'll talk about later, maybe didn't defend to the best of their abilities uh, last night against the Galaxy. Um, Bobby Warshaw did, I think, a slight bit of trolling uh, when he said in his match write-up, it's difficult to describe how the Sounders won or what they did right. It's still difficult for anyone except Sounders fans uh, at least to discern anything specific about the team's style of play. Is this, I didn't watch the game, but I've got to write a column? No, I think you probably (laughs) watched. There was much consternation in the comment section from Seattle fans. It seemed, the guess seemed to be that, like, he likes to troll Seattle. Bobby Bobby enjoys maybe poking, uh. poking Seattle with a stick. Uh, Joe, I was wondering if you could provide a bit more insight into how the Sounders were able to get this result. Because the narrative, again, Seattle fans don't love this one, was that like RSL were a bit more dominant in the first half, controlled possession, uh, kind of controlled the run of play. Seattle able to come out and change things up. So I guess first off, do you subscribe to the idea that RSL were a bit more dominant in the first half? And second, how were Seattle able to come out and, and win the game in the the end so hitting at that first question first you know that's that's the way to go mm-hmm. um i think rsl were were the better team in the first half but there's a little bit of a caveat to that because they possessed the ball well and the, their possession spacing was was really nice they had some some lovely passing sequences that often started from justin glad at right center back um but once they moved the ball forward they either lost it right before they could play the final ball or or they just weren't willing to actually pass that that last little bit that they needed to actually cr- create chances from their possession. So part of that boils down to RSL's reluctancy to actually make that decision in in the attacking area, but also part of that I think does come down to Seattle's defensive structure. So so in the first half they they conceded a lot of possession and and at halftime in his interview with Katie with him Brian Schmetzer wasn't particularly pleased with his his team's pressuring defensively uh, he, he wasn't happy with how rsl dictated play but then you saw them come out in the second half in their 442 defensive structure and they, they pressured more they were more aggressive in their block they won the ball not necessarily higher up the field but they were more efficient in how they pressured and how they cut off passing angles and won the ball and that's something we've seen from seattle this season is they they pretty much use that same 442 structure with lodero and, and rui diaz at the top and then two blocks of four underneath they're, they're efficient in, in cutting down space. And the first half, they were sloppy and a little lackadaisical. But I, I think their style of play is is built around the fact that when they win the ball from that 4-4-2, they can either transition quickly through Jordan Morris or th- or through Lodero and Rui Diaz and, and Jovan Jones when he's starting or Victor Rodriguez when he isn't. Or they can pull back a little bit and possess. And we saw a nice mixture of that in the second half. And I think that, versati- that versatility is what allowed them to climb on top of RSL a little bit after they refined their defensive structure a little bit. I saw um, on Twitter a gentleman named Taylor Rockwell was uh, noting that Jordan Morris got hacked down a lot in this game. Yeah, right? he did. Yeah, he did. Um, so I wonder, Joe, to your eyes, was that a sort of deliberate, like a thought through plan from Wales Salt Lake? Like, let's bring Jordan Morris down before he accelerates? Or were those acts of desperation? It's tough to say. I think. I mean, I think it could be a little bit of both. Not letting Jordan Morris get out in transition is is definitely one of the keys that you have to use when you're defending the Sounders. But also, I don't know that necessarily every single time that they brought him down, it was a conscious thought. Sometimes it, it just would be reactionary. So I'd say it's probably a little bit of both. But in general, bringing down Jordan Morris before he can burn in behind your back line is definitely the way to go, as long as it's not you know, obviously malicious. He's famously bad at free throws. So there is that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of malicious, uh, before we get to the red card, we should talk Nico. I want to talk mm. the red card, which was malicious. Um, Nico Ladero's chipped goal in the 81st minute. Good old Nico Ladero. Joe, can you talk us through this goal? Absolutely. So it came sort of up the Sounders' left side a little bit. Brad Smith found Raul Ruiz Diaz 
and and that this is the part that I like the most on this goal is Rui Diaz's composure. Well, that's that's the first part of what I like most on this one. <laughs> so he kind of waits perfectly for the right moment for Lodero to arrive in the box. He waits for him to have just enough separation. And then once once he's in a little bit of a pocket of space at the top of the box, uh, he, Rui Diaz plays Lodero in. And then the finish is just beautiful. It's it's a bending ball. It's It's almost like when you watch it, that it physically it shouldn't be able the, the ball shouldn't be able to bend like that. Um, but he <laughs> there bends it. It's sort of like I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys. It's sort of like an inside out swerve yeah, um, that yeah. he hits past Romando, and it's I mean, Romando just had no chance of getting to that. Everything about that finish, and then also the pass from Rui Diaz as well was was pretty much perfect. Yeah, it makes it really difficult if you're the goalkeeper to like adjust to that ball swinging right at you and then swinging away but still swinging on frame. My issue here is my co-host has decided to describe this as a chip. And I, yeah. I, I, it genuinely threw me for a minute. I was like, "Did I miss a goal?" What would you call it? I mean, he insteps and hits this hard. You like, think it's I, hard? I, oh, I, I, in my head, this is like kind of uh, slow, bendy. All right, Joe can be the tiebreaker here. I saw this as like he hits this like with his left foot instep at pace, and and almost I would have gone with like smashes it into the side netting. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I, in my mind, it chips kind of are a little bit more with the toe. Maybe I'm, I'm way off on that. Um, but this one was hit with some finesse into that top corner, but it, it was also with the instep. So I'm going to go ahead and tread that middle line to see <laughs> so good this month. Well, okay, let's settle it like this. In my defense, I was watching it in slow motion. Does that solve it? <laughs> I think the silence answers your question. <laughs> uh, Joe, I, I did have one more question for you, uh, at least for me, about this game. Uh, you mentioned Justin Glad's passing in the first half. That is something that like I am less familiar with because I don't watch that much RSL, but also because Justin Glad has been a player who's like been on the peri- periphery of the national team, then with the youth teams, then he gets kind of like dropped from RSL's starting lineup last season, had some issues this season. Is this like an aspect of his game that we haven't seen, or like or has been seen, and I've just missed it, or was this a thing that was kind of brought out last night for the playoffs and was a bit surprising? <laughs> So part of I think part of Glad's passing ability that, that we're seeing now comes down to the managerial change in Real Salt Lake. So changing from Mike Pecky over to Freddy Juarez, I think Juarez is more inclined to play out from the back and to use possession as a weapon than Pecky was. So part of it is that we're we're just seeing the skill set come to light. But I mean I'd be foolish if I if I said that he hasn't improved because we've we've seen him get some solid minutes and it's been sporadic, but we have Justin Glad has been in the lineup for RSL over the past couple of seasons. So he's had the chance to sort of come out and, and develop and develop in possession. And so the managerial change, I think, emphasizes that a little bit. I mean, also part of it could be he he had a, an experience in January camp with Berhalter at the very start of his tenure back back earlier this year. So all of those factors, whether that's Berhalter preaching to him the importance of, of playing out from the back and then Juarez taking over in, in Utah, I think both of those factors combine to sort of elevate Glad's passing ability on top of his 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 added experience in games as well. And from what I understand, we're going to get to see him for the US under 23s when they go for Olympic qualification. So um, even though he's on the losing end last night, that's an encouraging performance um, if you're going to be supporting the U23s through Olympic qualifying. Hey, this is Daryl and Taylor breaking in with some breaking news and also an ad read. All right. Let's start, with, let's start with the news. Okay. You already know, so it won't be news to you. It I might do. be news to some listeners. Tab Ramos, mm-hmm. U20 head coach, US Youth Technical Director, has stepped down. He is going to instead be the head coach of Houston Dynamo. Mm-hmm. We so, thought maybe Orlando City. Yeah. Uh, we weren't sure how he'd do with the humidity. Instead, he was like, I want even more humidity. Let's go to Houston. <laughs> So yeah, that, I think this is great for Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great just to see how Tab Ramos handles it because I've kind of always wondered what would he be like as a professional men's team head coach. But I don't want to think too much about that. I want to think more about what happens to the US youth teams because he's almost just... <laughs> what, do we have one coach left, I think? We have Rafael Vicky, right? Yeah. I mean, Jason, <laughs> um, Jason still there. Yeah. He's linked with the RSL job. We didn't oh, talk about no. that in today's show. Uh, yeah, so if you were to go back to RSL, Tab Ramos with Houston, I guess Rafael Vicky is coaching... All of the young teams. Yeah, so you 17 and up. Yeah. That's what he's sure. coaching. Sure. 17 plus. Yeah. Um, but Ramos was also youth technical was. director, which was genuinely an important role, right? He would, he, remember he put together that big January youth camp where all the youth team players mm-hmm. were um, invited to one gigantic camp yeah. um, in, I think, 2017. Uh, so I'm interested in basically, do we hire a new youth technical director or the fabled men's general manager, mm-hmm. does that person get that job and oversee uh, the, the senior team and all the youth teams below? That's what I would prefer because that 
org chart would make sense in my head. Spoiler alert for the first for the ending of the first season of The Sopranos. A little bit of I mean, there's been enough time. It's been a while ago. Yeah. But do you remember how basically that like, Tony leaves Junior in charge to be the lightning rod, and then he yes. keeps actually running things? I feel like that's what Tab Ramos was appointed to do under Jurgen Klinsmann. <laughs> he was sort of like actually run stuff. So I think now that Klinsmann's gone, Tab Ramos has left. Obviously, I do imagine that will sort of be absorbed under the responsibilities of maybe the new men's GM and yeah. then Ernie Stewart is still responsible for just overseeing everything I yeah, guess that would make sense yeah. I really hope that that's what happens alright um, I'd be alright with that with regards to today's sponsor mm-hmm. um, it applies to Tab Ramos it does so uh, it's away travel um, away travel thoughtful luggage for modern travel Tab Ramos obviously has been doing a lot of international trips as the U20 coach he's been to multiple uh, youth world cups he's been to more FIFA tournaments than anyone in history uh-huh. apparently between his men's world cup trips yeah. and his U20 world cup trips now he's going to be more of a domestic Traveler. And and here's the thing that I had not really thought about until you make that point is traveling with U.S. Uh, like youth national teams, traveling around the country to scout players. I'm gonna assume that's on U.S. Soccer's dime. They have I hope s- so several dimes. So I'm guessing he flies pretty well. Is I guess my yeah. point. With Major League Soccer teams, we know that there's only a limited number of charter flights. Yep. Sometimes coaches decline to sit in first class because they think it separates them. Yep. So Ty Ramos may be in need of some luggage that allows him to be oh, versatile yeah. in his travel. He might have to get used to a lot of carry-on and less yeah. checked luggage. At first, this seemed like kind of a gimmicky connection. Now I'm like, no, he might actually need this luggage. Ty Ramos, <laughs> buy yourself some away luggage. Luckily, mm-hmm. away has all kinds of sizes. They do. Uh, including the carry-on and the bigger carry-on. Um, I can tell you that they've, uh, they've sent me the bigger carry-on because I asked for it and mm-hmm. I'm very, very excited about it. You may remember on Twitter I said we've got a sponsor and I'm very excited because I've been trying to get them for years. Mm-hmm. I've really wanted Away <laughs> Travel to sponsor the Total Soccer Show. But like Tyron could go with the large, which I think is, is like the largest of their suitcase options. It's the biggest one that's thoughtfully designed and guaranteed to last a lifetime. He could put a smaller player in there and then that's one less <laughs> travel accommodation he has to worry about Saving that's a way to get around budget. it yeah, yeah I think Houston. so so he's going to sign some if you see Ramos signing some really short players yeah. you'll know that's what he's up you to you will it's weird that their copy doesn't include anything about uh, stowing humans for soccer games <laughs> it doesn't. it's odd it's, it's odd probably, that it doesn't probably wise on their part uh, it does mention what <laughs> <Suppose> uh, <it> <laughs> what away travel suitcases are made of which is what made me excited mm. about them it's a strong yet flexible polycarbonate mm-hmm. and an anodized aluminium so I'm really excited away travel can essentially handle the rough and tumble of baggage handlers. I'm so excited about it, I'm not even going to correct the pronunciation of that word that you just said. Aluminum? Uh, That's definitely what I said. There we go. There we go. Um, Yes, and I think you should be excited because we do have a trip upcoming. Are we talking more about that or are we going to leave that vague for now? I want to leave it slightly vague for now. Until next week. But you'll be using your away luggage. I sure will. I am am slightly jealous because I I do not yet have one. We'll see if I end up getting one. Who Uh knows? But you've got the 360-degree spinner wheels. I think on the suitcases I have that are rolly, they either roll in one direction and even then they tend to break. I think... Uh, when we were doing the tour, like, two summers ago, one of the wheels on my suitcase broke. So it was this weird, like, wobbly, very loud thing. You're yeah. not going to have that with Away. It's quality made. It's going to hold up. It's going to last a lifetime. Oh, yeah. It's also got uh, – this is what really, really drew them to me, mm-hmm. the ejectable battery. Tell, so me, tell me about this thing. There is a, ba- a lithium-ion battery embedded um, in the uh, in the suitcase itself. It's mm-hmm. near the handle. Um, it will charge your iPhone or any other phone five times, apparently. It's good for five charges. Um, but it's also – ejectable Mm -hmm. because you can't check a lithium ion battery you agree to that when you go through the hazardous materials thing but if you just push down on the battery it pops out and you can take it out um, of your of your away case and then you can check the luggage so you can carry it on and charge your phone or you can uh, click it out and it'll still work as a battery even after you click it out so then you carry then you carry on the battery check your luggage I am always I mean I also I'm one of those people that likes to have my Mm -hmm. ticket on my phone instead of paper I often have my ticket on my phone and 14% battery and let me tell you there's a power panicky moments. So with Away Travel, those days will be over. (laughs) Uh, I am certainly not a a Luddite. I mean, I do. We do a podcast for a living. But I do tend to be (laughs) hesitant about any new thing that's like a bunch of bells and whistles, because in my mind, those are things that can then break that you then have to have replaced. So I get a little bit wary of those. I see what you're doing, backup cameras. I don't trust you. (laughs) Uh, But I will say this, with Away, there's a limited lifetime warranty, means they will fix or replace any of those bells and whistles if they get damaged. So that battery, for example, if it malfunctions, if it starts to die, you've got the limited lifetime warranty. So you should be good to go. It's also a 100-day trial, so you can
can get an away travel suitcase. And if you don't like it, you can send it back. Mm -hmm. My guess is you will like it. You also won't be paying for shipping on any away order within the contiguous US. Sorry, Alaska and Hawaii. In your face, Hawaii. (laughs) Europe and Australia. You live in paradise, so you don't get free shipping. That's how it works. (laughs) What about Alaska? You get those free oil checks, so you don't get shipping. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) So the contiguous... Australia, you have to do with everything around you trying to murder you, including maybe some of the people. So yeah, you get free shipping. Why not? I listen to Case File. I know how rough it is out there. I don't, and I still do. Crocodile Dundee, Crocodile Dundee getting in knife fights all the time. It's it's a thing that happens. <laughs> you never There's know. also a special offer for mm. Total Soccer Show listeners. You'll get a straight up twenty dollars off what? any suitcase if you visit awaytravel.com slash tss and use the promo code TSS during checkout. Taylor, quick memory check. Uh, can you remember what the offer is and where people have to go? I believe I can. $20 off a suitcase visiting awaytravel.com slash TSS and using the promo code TSS at checkout. We've said it twice. If listeners can't remember that, don't worry. We'll put it in the show notes and you go. can click on it there. Even just click on the link and have a good look around. See if there's any away travel suitcases that you like the look of. I concur. And I would also add thank you very much to uh, Away Travel for sponsoring today's episode and for making Daryl happy by fulfilling his lifelong podcast objective of getting them as a sponsor. I've just realized I've been calling them Away Travel because that's the website. The mm-hmm. name of the company is just Away. away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I won't make that mistake again. But they if you're listening away. Thoughtful thug- uh, luggage, not thuggage. thuggage. Uh, thoughtful luggage for modern travel, and we appreciate them for that. So thank you very much to Away. <laughs> Just away. Thoughtful thuggage is what RSL did to Jordan Morris. That is correct. <laughs> uh, and with that in mind, let's get back to our conversation about uh, the MLS playoffs. Um, I, I, I lied. I have one more question. Sort of about this game, but it is also about like every team remaining in the playoffs. There seem to be a, a decent amount of defensive questions about all four, all four remaining teams. Joe, I guess like if I were forced to answer my own question, I would say that Seattle maybe have the the best looking defense right now. Which team do you think of the four uh, still left in the playoffs like has the best chance of uh, ho- holding their opposition scoreless or shutting down uh, opposition attacks? I mean, before yesterday, I would have said LAFC just because they have been so dominant as a as an entire unit this season from from front to back. Essentially, they've defended well. Um, but now I'm kind of torn. I, I don't know whether it, Seattle has the talent, the defensive talent, but they like to push forward a lot, and that can be exposed in transition. So uh, Atlanta United as well, I think, is is a team that's defensively capable. So I think I think I'm still going to say LAFC because they they have proven consistently over the season that that they're a top defensive team, and now they'll they'll hopefully have Walker Zimmerman back in the fold for their next match as well. But that's a great question. The defensive kind of errors and, and problems that these teams have had has been really interesting to watch. And I hope it's something that MLS you know, roster decision makers are kind of paying attention to as they continue to construct their rosters for future seasons. That, that would make sense to me. Uh, I think Atlanta tried to deal, deal with that by bringing in some defenders and some capable replacements. And then they were without due to injury last night. Uh, they did not have Michael Parker. So they did not have Miles Robinson. They may have them for the next round, we think, but maybe that's unlikely. Are you letting Everton Louise get away with that red card without talking about it? I mean, it was a bad red card, I guess. Yes, we can talk about that if you want. <laughs> I get, to be honest, there's not that much to say, right? It was obviously a red card, mm-hmm. and yeah, he absolutely deserves the red card that he got. He maybe deserved the flags waved in his face just for like, <laughs> the, the added punishment as well. Um, if we are going to talk about the only question I would have is he seemed to gesture at Svensson as if Svensson had come in on him. Is there any validity to that to that claim? See, I thought, uh, if anything, I thought he was getting up as though, like, I didn't do anything to you. Like, why are you screaming on the ground? Yeah. It seemed to be that more that, like, indignant, like, like how it dare you that fake yeah, yeah. sort of thing. And then he went back in afterwards. John Strong said for a handshake, it seemed to me like he was <laughs> talking some trash. Uh, so I did not get the impression that Everton Luis felt – uh, like he was hard done by this decision, but more so he was just annoyed by everything that had happened. That's my read on that one. I'm I'm with you guys. I think it was a a pretty clear red card. The aftermath was entertaining to watch at the very least. I mean, <laughs> I, once once Svensson, once it was clear that he was okay, just all the events that unfolded after the the little bit of a scrum, Everton Louise trying to go back in for more, or maybe for a polite handshake, he might be a gentleman. Uh, we don't know. Um, <laughs> and then walking along. 
the the Sanders supporter section and then across the bench area. It was yeah. it, I don't know, it made for some entertaining television at the it very least. It was, it was good spectacle. That, right. That's for sure. Now we've shamed Everton Louise. I am ready to move on <laughs> to Atlanta to Philadelphia nil. Uh, Taylor alluded to the defensive problems. Right? Miles Robinson injured. Michael Parkhurst injured um, in the last game. Uh, what De Boer went with in the end was a back four with Gonzalez Perez and Florentine Pogba. Um, how like how secure did that look? I mean, I know they won two 0 but how secure would you say that looked, Joe, over the course of ninety minutes? It looked much more secure than I th- I thought it would, and I think a lot of credit needs to go to that back line in midfield as well for the for Atlanta United. But then some also some blame, I suppose, to the Philadelphia Union. They didn't look as dangerous in their four four two diamond in that first half as. As, as obviously they wanted to, but as I expected them to. Uh, Fafa Pico starting over Andrew Vooten in that front two alongside Sergio Santos. They didn't have the same attacking energy that they really needed to break through Atlanta. And part of that, I think, was because of the just the momentum hit that they took after allowing that early goal to Julian Gressel. But, I mean, absolutely credit to Atlanta United. They they kind of ran out there with a makeshift back line. I mean, Mikey Ambrose playing at left back, who's barely played this entire season. That's yeah. a big decision from Frank DeBoer to use him in a big playoff game that shows, you know, that he has trust it truly in, you know, 1 through 22 on this roster. So, absolutely, Atlanta do deserve props for being able to shut out the union. Even even though the game wasn't home, they had to deal with that makeshift back line and some injury problems. And with, with everything you've just said, like it, it actually makes me double down on my criticisms of Jim Curtin a little bit because you've got like a relatively inexperienced left back. You've got a deputizing left center back. Uh, like It felt like that's the area that you should attack with consistency, try to make them uncomfortable, and if nothing else, try to make Atlanta shift people over to sort of help reinforce that left-hand side. Instead, at least in the first like 20 minutes or so it felt like most of the attacks for Philly were coming down the left and then looking central which is where Atlanta seemed stronger to me at least so like I guess uh, with all that in mind Joe do you feel like Jim Curtin sort of got his lineup and tactics right you already talked about Fafa Pico starting but are there other things you think he could have done or should have done to get a stronger result uh, or at least uh, any result in the first half I I think I agree with pretty much everything you said there Taylor Pico on that right side of the Union attack, which allowed him to match up a little bit with with Pogba and Ambrose, makes sense on paper, right? That's he's got a little bit more speed, a little bit more skill on the ball than some of the Union's other attacking options, forward options at least. So matching him up against those guys seemed to make a lot of sense. But I think that was a plan on paper, but it it just didn't turn out to be what Jim Curtin wanted it to be in reality. Atlanta United came out. And they controlled the midfield at the start of the game, which is what allowed them to get on the board early. And then at that point, the Union were playing catch up a little bit because once Atlanta United hopped out to that early lead, they sat a little bit deeper. They sat in a 4-4-2 block and sat in their own half and allowed the Union to possess a little bit more, but essentially just cut off a lot of the attacking angles to to Pico and, and to some of the Union's other offensive options. So because... Atlanta got out to the the hot start early on. That sort of limited the Union's ability to attack as effectively as they wanted to. Let's talk about that hot start. Uh, Julian Gressel in the 10th minute. This was a chip, right? I've got this one right. This was <laughs> definitely a chip. Chipped about four people yeah. um, with this goal. And the, the really clever part of this um, was the Pity Martinez pass. So first of all, I, I'm kind of interested in why, Joe, why do you think De Boer chose to not start Martinez last game, but um, have him start this game? And also, why why was it such an effective selection, right? Because he did pick out that pass that, like, when you rewatch it, that pass doesn't seem obvious, but it was obvious to Pity Martinez, and he found Julian Gressel in a lot of space. I think De Boer decided not to go with Martinez in the last game because maybe he wanted a little bit of of a holistic defensive effort from his team. He wanted guys. I mean, Emerson Hyman is essentially the the straight swap there. Yeah. He wanted Hyman maybe to put in a little bit more defensive effort and also rotate a little bit more in the attack. And those are are not necessarily things that we see from Pitti Martinez on a regular basis. He tends. I mean, in this game, he was often not isolated, but he he was a little bit higher as a as an attacking midfielder in sort of a four two three one in possession. So he had a, had a simpler role, and it allowed him to to connect play maybe slightly better than Barco can, but also at a slightly slower pace as well. Barco is a little bit more aggressive than Martinez in his movement. He, he likes to go downhill a little bit more. So I think it made sense. I think I think I can understand the roster decision, at least from De Boer. And then uh, at this point, I've talked so long, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> I think I think there was only one part. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. great. Then it, was just, it was just one very long question. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah, well, I, well, with the board in mind, uh, like the narrative 
it seemed to be, at least on Twitter, so grain of salt there, seemed to be that Frank DeBoer was like winning because he had moved away from his style and his system and embraced one that was more similar to what Tata had Atlanta doing last season. So essentially, Atlanta were winning because they were doing what was familiar to them as opposed to what Frank DeBoer had asked of them earlier in the season. Do you agree with that sort of narrative or do you think it's unfair? I personally don't subscribe to the to the entirety of that narrative. I think there is some middle ground in almost everything. There's always, you know, a middle. But I think we saw Frank DeBoer come out and, and try to mold this team into something different at the beginning of the year, and it didn't work. Then we saw midseason them adjust a little bit, and I think that's where they've been over the last couple of months is sort of in that middle ground between Atlanta's high high attack, high energy transition structured team to we've seen a, a contrast between that and then also DeBoer's a little bit slower more pragmatic possession and and a little bit of a deeper defensive team and I think that's absolutely what we saw we saw Atlanta come out and possess the ball at the beginning of the match they used some clever positioning and possession to get Gressel in space on the on the weak side of the field just just past the midline vertically and that got Gressel in space to to eventually score that chip over Andre Blake and, and a few other Union defenders as well. <laughs> and then we saw them play more conservative. We saw them sit a little bit deeper and eventually late in the match they took advantage of the Union pushing forward and then they played into space behind them. I think I think there's a perfect middle ground there. So. I, I do subscribe to the theory in part that, that DeBoer has had to compromise his, his beliefs and his values, but I don't think it's necessarily been a, a complete compromise that, that most people or that some people are, are ascribing it to be. So the Gressel ball for the Martinez goal um, in the 80th minute to, to make this 2-0 and basically kill the game was obviously very direct, but very obviously the correct ball. So maybe that's one of the best examples um, of what we're talking about here. Like Maybe early in the season, Gressel would have been encouraged to pass that sideways mm-hmm. and not um, long down the middle for Joseph Martinez to score um, really a magnificent goal. But I have a feeling that Mark McKenzie could have done better here. I think mm-hmm. he could have met this ball in the air and basically headed it clear. And I don't understand why he hesitated and didn't make a play on the ball while it was while it was gettable. Do you have any sort of read on this, Joe? Like what, what happened to Mark McKenzie? I think part of it boils down to the fact that it's just an awkward angle to deal with. He's trying to tra- he's trying to track Joseph Martinez. You know, at a high speed here, and then he also has to look back, kind of like a wide receiver or a cornerback in the NFL, has to look over and, and deal with that ball as he's running. And so, and, unless I misread that play, I think I think the mistake isn't, you know, it's not an acceptable defensive play from McKenzie, but it, it is a little bit understandable. Um, so I, I understand the position that he was in, the difficult situation. But yeah, if you're a starting center back coming against Joseph Martinez in a late game situation where your team still has a chance to equalize, that's a really, really tough defensive mistake to make. Um, but then also, you mentioned it, Daryl, but credit to Julian Gressel and Joseph Martinez. These guys have, somehow they have this telepathic connection that I feel like allows them to link up anywhere on the field. Gressel could be playing center back and Martinez could be playing anywhere else in the attack and they could still find a way to to pass back and forth. It's it's unreal to watch. And I would extend that to even the first goal, uh, Gressel's goal. Joseph Martinez makes a run, like kind of where uh, Gressel ends up hitting the ball is where Martinez starts his run. He makes a run across the top of the 18, takes I think three Philly defenders with him because he is that dangerous and that opens up that space for Gressel. So even there you've got the telepathy at work. But it does make me then wonder, Joe, like this is a very – Silly question, and I will give you some more context to it. But essentially, my question is like, how good is Joseph Martinez? Because this goal was, in my mind, like an incredible feat of skill to bring it down to control it in stride and then hit it at the tight angle. He does. I think it speaks to a lot of like the confidence and self belief to be able to attempt that and pull it off. But I also can't tell how much of it is Atlanta being built around him. And so I guess, like, let's say with LA, if you took the LA Galaxy, Zlatan left, or not, I'm not even going to give you a hypothetical scenario. I'm just going to say if we just swapped Zlatan and Joseph Martinez, are the Galaxy a better team with Joseph Martinez in there? Or does his game, because it's so different than Zlatan, like, does it drop off or is he still as productive? I think he's just as productive. The Galaxy. Uh, would be able to use him in a somewhat similar way to the way they use Ibrahimovic, even though there's a, a massive size disparity there. Martinez is Slightly. just yeah. so well-rounded. <laughs> um, just he's capable of winning balls in the air. Although, to be fair, in this game against the Union, he did miss several chances that were pretty clear cut that, that yeah. he probably should have converted. I took um, that as him just wanting to remind us all that he's mortal. So after he scores that goal, <laughs> he then has to miss the kind of like open one from 12 yards out. That was very decent of him. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good reminder that he's that he is not God. Um, but yeah, Martinez, he's just he's unreal for Atlanta. 
he allows them to play in so many different ways based on the moment, right? So he can he can drop in and he's clean on the ball. He's he's hold up play for for someone who's not the biggest striker is fantastic. Then he can get in behind, run off the ball in behind the opposing back line and find space that way. Or like you mentioned, he can he can sort of make these sacrificial runs that allow some of the other attacking players to be highlighted and their skills to be used more efficiently. So if you put Joseph Martinez on any team in this league, he would make them you know infinitely better. And and that just really speaks to the talent that Atlanta have found in him and I'm really interested to see if he sticks around in MLS for the next few seasons how much more his production can improve over the course of those seasons the feeling seems to be that he will stick around mm-hmm. right isn't that quote from him last year where he sort of says this is my Real Madrid yeah. I'm not looking to I think move he's pretty happy anywhere. Yeah. I yeah. agree yeah I think he's happy here so do you think we just see him like multi multi years in Major League Soccer and just absolutely blitz the goal scoring records where no one will ever touch it I'm here for it. That would be so incredible to watch. <laughs> Just sustained success, regardless of whether Atlanta can keep it up. Yeah. Having Martinez as their focal point and, and just watch him bang in goals year after year would be great. I think we've just jinxed him into leaving this January. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, one final question for me on this game, and it's about the union again. Uh, like Jim Curtin at halftime, when he was asked like what they were going to do, he talked about Il Signo as though it was this sort of like mic drop, drop, drop moment. And the only time I've heard a coach talk about a player like that is when it was like Jurgen Klinsmann announcing the debut of like Julian Green we're going to see him in the second half and like Christian Pulisic we're going to see him in the second half and Jim Curtin said the same thing about El Senior, like yeah. oh we're going to see him and it was this sort of like you know you you could start him like that would be <laughs> fine and it does seem like he is this like super sub figure for Philadelphia so I'm wondering why is that the case is it injuries is it fitness why can't El Senior play a whole game because he does seem to be this massively impactful player for them I don't quite get why Jim Curtin had this whole halftime reveal of oh he's coming and he's going to do stuff even though he could have done that same stuff in the first half potentially I I completely agree with everything you said the motivation at least in my mind behind Curtin's decision to consistently bring him off the bench and not start him is that well I think there are two parts to it the first is that he El Sino can come on and run at a little bit more tired legs Um, he has some more space to run in on and and he can manipulate the defense a little bit better when when they've already played some minutes and, and had some intense moments um, but then again, I think the other part is that he El Senio messes with the union's shape. They have to change it to to fit him a little bit because he he's not going to really perform the defensive duties necessary from from any one of those positions in the diamond. So they typically change to a four two three one and put him on the right wing where he can just sit on that sideline and, and go back and forth at his leisure. But essentially, his role is to receive the ball wide and make magic happen. And I think all of those things, if you start out like that in a game, maybe you don't have the same structure. Maybe you can't shut down Atlanta's midfield, even though they weren't able to do that at the beginning of the match anyway. But your your chances to do that, to, to be solid defensively and then also structured in attack, maybe go down a little bit. So did Curtin need to be El Senio's hype man at halftime? Probably <laughs> not. Um, but I think I think there is some logic behind the decision. Can we copy and paste everything you just said about El Senio and have it applied to Marco Fabian? Is it the same situation where he doesn't fit the defensive scheme and the shape, but he's, you know, bring him off the bench and he does something magic? I think so. I think Brendan Aronson is much more willing to make those sacrificial defensive runs and and off ball move off the ball in the attack as well to let some of the other you know front two or midfield players shine. And Marco Fabian really isn't. He's he's more of he needs the ball at his feet. He needs to have touches, and then defensively he can be a liability just because of the type of player he is. So I think a lot of the same principles absolutely apply there. So I'm going to say well done to the Philadelphia Union and Jim Curtin for getting this far in the playoffs despite having two high-profile players that don't (laughs) fit the system. You somehow found a way to make that work and keep those players, I'm going to say, relatively happy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say Bob Bradley did the same for LAFC. He oh, yeah. found a way to make his players happy. Uh, Joe, I would ask you about Carlos Vela previously struggling to shine on the big stage, but I'm afraid that Bob Bradley <laughs> will Hulk smash through the door and get mad at me. Or Joe will just tell you to get lost. Or that, or that. So instead, <laughs> <I> um, <wouldn't. laughs> sorry, Joe. I wouldn't do that to you. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you for for not Hulk smashing. Um, I will ask you this. Can we take anything away from this game as we look ahead to LAFC's Western Conference Final with Seattle? Because, like, this game was just so intense and emotional from the start. Both defenses looked suspect at times. The attack looked like they were hell-bent on attacking, like, throughout. And I guess I I don't know if there are tactical takeaways from this or if it was just so emotional that we sort of got to take our breath and then be like, all right. Now let's see what LAFC <laughs> did this season and what they might do against Seattle. And can I just interrupt before Joe answers to say this is LAFC's 5-3 mm-hmm. win over the LA Galaxy in El Trafico. Although I doubt there's any MLS fan that missed it, right? Everybody stayed up and watched this, I would assume. I'm waiting to see the TV numbers. Grant Wall drank two cups of coffee. <laughs> 
edgy. Is that, very is that a lot for him? Uh, I think it was, yes. <laughs> I drank a lot of coffee, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My sort of overarching takeaway, and, and this is Bob Bradley's as well, at least it was before he power walked out of that interview with uh, Sebastian <laughs> Salazar, is that LAFC are so good that they can make mistakes and still win games. Um, and that's something that some of these other teams, the, the final teams remaining in this playoff field, can't say. Um, LAFC w- were far from perfect uh, last night in this in this matchup, but they still have so much talent and so much skill, even when they're not at their best in possession or defensively, that they can come out and score five goals and, and really put in a, sem- a semi-convincing performance on the way to, to a Western Conference final. So not just so few other teams in the league's history have been able to say that. So we really are witnessing something special in L.A. So I have a take on sort of what makes LA so dangerous and maybe able to overcome any defensive mistakes. Is it just Carlos Vela? Is it, that your whole theory? Well, it's partly the the front three that Bradley plays uh-huh. with and the replacements that come in mean that they have what I would call in this game pace on pace on pace on pace, yeah. right? So Rossi, Vela and Rodriguez all have pace about them, which is kind of terrifying. And then you've got guys like Diamande to bring in, who's also plenty fast. And it's just like a constant threat that you're facing when you're the LA Galaxy or any other opponent and then you've got midfielders who are super comfortable moving the ball guys like win and blessing so it always ends up that you move the ball through midfield then you're able to release these pacey attackers and you've got defenders just constantly scrambling um polenta i thought really strong he's at fault for at least three goals i think he was pressed for the first goal and lost he was uh, lost diamande he was marking him but lost him for pace on like the fourth goal and just got absolutely turned and burned by him on the Fifth goal. I would say uh, uh, LAFC are vegetarian because they had polenta for dinner three times. <laughs> well done. Well done. Taylor's shaking his head at me. <laughs> I should have known it was coming. <laughs> but I'm mostly just mad at myself for not knowing it was coming. That's all. <laughs> but my bigger point is if you've got like one defender who's maybe not that yeah. fast, like suddenly when you've got all pacey attackers, that defender's at some point going to get exploited. I, I think that's what makes LAFC uh, so dangerous. Is that too simplistic, Joe, or is that like a, like a, a decent read on LAFC's attack? No, I think that's a great read on their attack, especially in the context of this game. Um, Their game plan, LAFC's game plan, was to allow the Galaxy to possess more than they're comfortable with and and to sort of Mm -hmm. bait them forward and then use their their attacking speed and transition to run at that back line exactly how you described it. So I think that's a a perfect description of of their abilities in general and then even more so just how they approach this game. And it, it eventually paid off, absolutely. We're interrupting once again, not with breaking news no? this time, no, unless you know something I don't. I don't. You don't? It's not anything. You don't know anything nah. that I don't. No. Nah. <laughs> um, but not with a new sponsor either. It's with our oldest sponsor. I know something. They've been with us since the early 1700s. It's Roughneck <laughs> Scarves sponsoring today's episode. They did make the scarves for the American Revolution. Yes. Right? That's a, less, yeah. like a lesser known thing. They were there, Battle of Bunker Hill, uh-huh. like lots of drama, when lots Washington, of When Washington crossed the Delaware, uh-huh. his neck was warm. Of course. Thanks to Roughneck Scarves. Yeah, of course. Uh, because in addition to look being... look closely in the paintings. I guess the official scarf provider of the American Revolution, they are also the official scarf providers of U.S. Soccer, MLS, the NCAA, and the USL. Obviously today, we're mm-hmm. going to focus on Major League Soccer. If you go to the MLS segment at Roughneck Scarves, you can find not just a scarf for each team it's not just one scarf that says atlanta united there's multiple atlanta united scarves for example (laughs) i'm using atlanta because they're the first team that comes up that makes sense Um, so there's the united and conquer scarf in various different colors Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got uh uh, same thing with lafc mostly the same colors you've got black gold like some silver in there some white in there but mostly black and gold lafc has some good strong graphic basic but very strong graphic design right Yeah. yeah They uh they did well there. It's almost like they're like fully owned by a bunch of different celebrities who all have connections to interesting people who do interesting artistic <laughs> things. So whichever MLS team you support, mm-hmm. one that's in the playoffs or one that hasn't even played a game yet, like Austin FC, mm-hmm. um, they have a scarf for you at Roughneck Scarves. Dot see, com. they can see the past, they can see the present, they can even see the future. <laughs> that's how good they are. Hopefully they can see the future because Chicago Fire still have a bunch of scarves uh-huh. with the name Chicago Fire. Yeah. So that name isn't going anywhere, according to RoughneckScarves.com. I want Roughneck to just start doing like put possible potential future iterations where you just get like yeah. random teams. They're like, wait, hold on. Is that an, is that an official expansion team? Did, did I hear about this? <laughs> Juno, Alaska is getting an MLS team? What has happened? I'm confused. The Juno Jitterbugs? Sure. Perfect, Daryl. <laughs> wow. 
And that every time they score a goal, they have to do that dance. I mean, to be fair, first of all, now I'm back in. I'm all, I'm, <laughs> I'm on board for that one. I forgot about the jitterbug dance. Uh, you, you are correct though, because the J the Jays would be tough because it's like jaguars. I don't know if there's jaguars running around Alaska. I'm not yeah. sure what else there could be. The Juno oil checks. <laughs> Is that the second oil check reference in this show? Yes. All right. <laughs> well, uh, until they make the Juno oil checks uh, official scarf, uh, as we said, you can get scarves for U.S. soccer, MLS, the NCA, and the USL. You can also get custom scarves. If the Juno jitterbugs, the rival <laughs> to the Juno oil checks, want to create their own custom scarf, they could do that. They can, they certainly can, yeah. I also just want to give you an idea of the breadth of available scarves. Oh, There's boy. a Colorado Rapids 2010 MLS Cup champion scarf Woo. available at Roughneck Scarves. I believe that's the one that Sam Seshko last night referred to as the MLS Cup that we don't speak of anymore. <laughs> so That's maybe Ma- not the most fun. The Matt Kanji winner, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Wow. Go all on. right. All right. <laughs> uh, so if you want to check out what Roughneck Scarves has on offer, you can. You can go to R-U-F-F-N-E-C-K scarves.com. Oh, I thought you were going to spell scarves as well. S-C-A-R-V-E-S yes. dot. That's like a period and then yeah. C-O-M. Lovely. You don't want to write out dot. That would be confusing. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. But what you do want to do is use the code Total Soccer Show, all one word, all together at checkout to get 20% off any any scarf or scarves if you're buying multiple. All right. Once again, that's roughneckscarves.com. Total soccer show for 20% off any scarf or scarves that you're buying at roughneckscarves.com. As ever, the link will be in the show notes. Roughneck Scarves, the company that won the Revolutionary War. And with that in mind, thank you to Roughneck Scarves for winning the war and for sponsoring today's episode. Back to us talking LA versus LA. I think LA win and LA lose. We'll see how LA feel about that. So we can't talk about all eight goals, um, but maybe an important one we should talk about is the one that I think was probably offside. Mm -hmm. It's the 40th minute Carlos Vela goal where I think it's Rodriguez who bursts through and squares it to him. But when uh, I think it's Latif Blessing plays Rodriguez through, we're pretty sure from the, the, the replays that Rodriguez was offside, right? So Joe, do you know much about how VAR works in MLS? Why was this not called back for what seems a pretty obvious offside on Rodriguez? So I think it's all about the, the language that's used. We hear it all the time, clear and obvious, clear and obvious, clear and obvious. And I, there's, it's subjective, right? Because what's, what's clear and obvious? How do we know what the, what the referee is seeing and what the VAR official is seeing and whether or not they, they believe that those narrow decisions warrant further review? And so I believe that it, the VAR is structured that they review all of these goal-scoring goal plays regardless. But then it's up to those, those individuals to decide – whether or not it, it, it is actually clear and obvious and the decision can be reversed on an offside call like that. So I'm yet to see an angle that leads me to believe that it was super, super obvious in general. So in the moment, at least, I think I, I could understand the call. But then again, if you're an LA Galaxy fan, how are you not supposed to feel hard done by this, yeah. this goal that you're still in the match at this point? And then there's this decision that that really does look like like it could warrant some further review or at least – an explanation as to why or why not the decision was made. So, I mean, it, it's just a frustrating utilization of the technology right now. And I'm hopeful, uh, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful that we'll see sort of a revamp on how it's used or at least how it's communicated in future seasons. So uh, Carlos Vela, obviously a very impressive performance. Diego Rossi, I thought equally impressive. The player that stood out for me in a way that I didn't expect him to, like the one that I went and checked just to make sure he couldn't play for the U.S. national team, I'm wondering if Gerald did the same, is Latif Blessing, who I, I thought was really impressive in terms of like some of the balls he played in. Daryl mentioned the, the, the second goal, even if it was offside, still a good ball. <laughs> but that he just – he seemed to be the one who could put out the fires when LAFC were – Overly focused on attacking when they commit numbers forward, he seemed to be the one who still had the engine even in the the very end of the game to be able to like like shut down counterattacks, shut down attackers, cause problems. And I was just very very impressed by uh, his performance last night. So I'm wondering from a general standpoint, Joe, w- what is it that he brings to LAFC, and what did you make of him last night? Latif Blessing brings a number of things. He brings defensive effort more so than than maybe any other player in this league, which allows exactly like you said, Taylor, which allows some of the other players to focus more on attacking and not worry as much about their defensive contributions. Not that they don't have to contribute, but Blessing can sweep up a lot of those those issues. And especially in a game without uh, Mark Anthony K in midfield, where Lee Wynn is a little older, he doesn't have the same legs that Mark Anthony K does to cover ground and to cut out passing angles. So Blessing's performance was even more key from a, from a defensive perspective. And then offensively, you also touched on it. He's he's becoming 
you know, a, a well-rounded central midfielder, which is not something that I necessarily expected to see from him a couple of seasons when he was playing more as a wide player, whether that's for Sporting Kansas City or or coming into L.A. when, you know, we had, that's all we had seen from him. You know, I expected him to, to continue to be sort of an energizer bunny on the wing. <laughs> but now we see him turning with pressure and, and turning out of it, using a low center of gravity to to move the ball through the opposing defense and turn and, and play these passes as you already highlighted. That's that's a special ability. We're seeing a player truly adapt to a new position, and he's done it flawlessly for LAFC this season. I also want to talk tactically about the changes that Bob Bradley made throughout the game. He brought on uh, Walker Zimmerman, and he brought on um, an extra centre-back towards the end whose name, I'm about to call him Stankovic, but I think that's the wrong name. I think it is Yakovic, Yakovic, I believe. Yakovic, yeah. Yeah. Yakovic, Yakovic. yeah, he brought Yakovic. Um, can I assume that this is um, in response to the thing that we talked about? I think it's Dejan Yakovic. I think that's why you did that. That's I think it. you made him Dejan Stankovic. That's it. I made him way more talented, but he's still pretty good, right? Um, so he brought on Zimmerman, he brought on Yakovic, um, and it seemed in my head I was thinking about that game where the LA Galaxy were able to just play long to Zlatan and kind of they, they destroyed the LAFC that way. Um, was this a case of Brad Bradley seeing what had happened in the past and being like, all right, I know what to do. I'm going to just fill this field with centre-backs and make sure we win aerial balls. I think Bradley was absolutely keeping that in the back of his mind. You you bring in a guy like Walker Zimmerman and move Tristan Blackman, who started at right centre-back, out to out to right-back. You you have a little bit more height defensively, having Zimmerman come in for Beta Shore, um, and you try to cut off circulation to to Ibrahimovic. Essentially, you you try to deny him the ball aerially, and then also hope that Zimmerman has the foot speed to get forward, and then Yakovic eventually as well to to step and deny him the ball if they try to play him on the on the ground. And that's that's something that we didn't see LAFC manage especially well. At least some of those those loose balls in midfield, we didn't see them maybe step as quick as they needed to to clear some of that danger. Um, so allowing a guy like Zimmerman to come in first and and have him cut off some of that the play to Zlatan, right. I think it made sense from Bob Bradley. It didn't allow him to truly go for it in an attacking sense, but sometimes you have to you have to cut off the opposing team's attacking ability to be able to start some of your own. So well done to Bob Bradley, even though he was rude to Sebi Salazar. <laughs> um, I do want to talk, unless anyone's got anything else tactical to talk, I want to talk big picture about this game and its perceived importance. Yeah. I heard it talked about as the most anticipated playoff game of all time, as if we haven't hyped MLS Cups mm-hmm. before. And then I also heard um, Taylor Twelman on the yeah. ESPN broadcast like the watershed call event. this a watershed moment for Major League Soccer. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know why, but I just, I'm, I'm not convinced or I don't really understand what he means by that. Does he mean that like suddenly the next TV contract's going to be gigantic because this one game had eight goals in it? It just, I don't feel like there's any actual watershed here. I think it, like to jump in for, for a moment, I think part of that was informed by him being there. And I do think I'm that feeling if, the atmosphere. Yeah. I think if you were there, like it, it was by, by, by my eye. No disrespect to Atlanta, who did Atlanta things, but that was the most like raucous atmosphere. I think because it's, I think part of it is because it's all black. It has that more intimidating yeah, yeah. vibe, but like that that wall behind the goal is just so like interesting, and there's so many flags. But the, even at the I end, like the when bouncing you, left and right, you had everybody yeah. bouncing, but you had like the whole stadium bouncing. You had the smoke everywhere. It was L.A. You had celebrities there. I think if you were in that stadium, you felt this like nothing has ever been like this before and yeah. never will be again. And I think that's partially where that was coming from. That said, I would also add that this was the game that felt like the best advertisement for Major League Soccer, not just because of the scoreline, but because, yes, there were individual mistakes. There's always going to be individual mistakes, but there were so many moments in which I expected the right back to have to just boot the ball up the field because there was nothing else on. And instead it would be like a Cruyff turn and a tight pass back and then Uh another tight pass and then another tight pass. And it did seem like these two teams had a lot of the technical precision that some other Major League Soccer teams do not. And Mm. so I think it also was a better advertisement, even if it was chaotic and insane and there were eight goals, it still, were there eight goals final or were there just seven goals? Okay, Uh, thank you. Um, But it still was just this like very interesting game for so many different reasons that I think that's where that came from. That said, I still think Taylor Twelman was being slightly emotional with that statement. Do you, do you think maybe he's almost trying to convince his bosses at ESPN that like, <laughs> hey, this is this is a big deal. You guys should pay more for the next contract. You never know. You never know. <laughs> maybe don't switch channels halfway through. He's got to afford that, afford his uh, Taylor somehow. So uh, <laughs> maybe yeah, a better TV contract helps with that. <laughs> he's designated Taylor. Yes. <laughs> um, anything else to add on this game? Not, Not for me. For I me. think yeah. I think you guys covered it well. All right. The one thing I would, the one thing we kind of skipped over was Nick Romando's retirement. We did. Um, he was very emotional in the post-match interview, and it really made me 
really made me feel for him. Really? Yeah, just the, the little catch in his voice as he was uh, as he was saying how much the game has meant to him and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I liked him saying that he was going to go home, take his kids to school, and then go back and drink whiskey. And Is that what he said? Like, yes, he was like, "We get it at two a.m. I'm going to take my kids to school. I'm going to go back home, put my feet up, maybe have a few whiskeys." And so, re- like, boy. Retirement starts now. <laughs> exactly. Retirement yes. starts. Now. Yes, I enjoyed that immensely. Well, I I mean, it will be strange it. to not have him. Like behind the sticks, it's one of those sort of like just an ever present fixture of Major League Soccer. Yeah, same thing. Like at least we still have Kyle Beckerman running around. If both of them <laughs> retired at the same time. I don't really know what I would do. <laughs> Kyle Beckerman was actually kind of impressive. In that yeah, he guy. was. Yeah, he was all over the place. Man. Yeah, he was. Yeah, cut that hair he was, off. He and you was, get aerodynamic. <laughs> he was way better in this in this two playoff games so far for RSL than I expected him to be. Um, which is both him and Ramondo is such a tribute to their longevity, right? I don't think either one has ever been the most talented player, but they've continued to be effective over long stretches of time, and that's that's truly impressive in its own right. All right, well, let's look to the uh, conference finals semifinals. for a moment. Uh, no, these are the conference finals now. These We're- are the MLS Cup semifinals. <laughs> oh, you're calling them the semifinals? I see what you're doing here. I was like, what? Uh, I- I'm going to say with confidence that I do not think Toronto will host MLS Cup. Uh, it's a bold <laughs> statement for me. I'm willing to say that. Uh, Joe, like, what are you expecting from these two games, Atlanta hosting Toronto, LAFC hosting Seattle? So let's start in the Eastern Conference. Uh, on the right side of the playoff bracket, this one's going to be really interesting, I think, just because... I, I kind of don't know how Toronto is going to approach this matchup. We, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but we saw them come out against NYCFC and they pressed high. And that was that was how they chose to approach the beginning of that game to get their attack involved. But then against Atlanta, who don't necessarily – they aren't as committed to playing out from the back. Toronto is going to have to manage their midfield a little bit more. They have to, they're going to have to – align their defensive midfield to to sort of prevent access and deny access into Atlanta United central midfielders. So whether that's Nagby or Lorenowitz or Eric Rometty, if if Jeff Lorenowitz has to slide back to center back at some point, or, you know, Pitti Martinez or Barco or Gressel, I mean, any of these guys that are tucking into midfield, Toronto are going to have to truly manage that space, which which is going to be difficult for them because they don't have the same speed that the union do in midfield. They don't have the players that are as capable of shutting down those passing angles. Osorio and Delgado are to an extent, but Michael Bradley certainly isn't. Although, to be fair, Harris Madunian is, is not the most mobile player either, and the union did at times manage to shut down some of that access. So the midfield is where I'm, I'm really going to be watching this, this match to see how Toronto managed it. But then will they be able to do a better job of exposing some of the, the holes in Atlanta's back line than the Philadelphia Union did uh, this past this past round? Will Toronto have Josie Altidore number one? And if not, will Alejandro Pozuelo continue to perform as this free-roaming false nine of sorts? And will will he be able to pull the strings in the attack? So those are two areas that I'm looking for in that game for yeah. sure. Actually, I was going to ask you about that. Do you know anything about Josie Altidore's fitness or otherwise? And I guess the other question is, Given Pozuelo's performance against NYCFC as a sort of false nine, does it even matter? Yeah, because I was going to – that that's, like goes along with what I was wondering, which is if Toronto looked impressive and were able to cause such problems to NYCFC in that game, if they want to employ a similar approach against Atlanta, is there an argument to be made that you don't start Josie Altador, fitness concerns aside, or incorporating the fitness concerns, but also because – it requires you to change it up a little bit versus this worked against NYCFC. We got it right. Let's just do the same thing again against Atlanta. If, if Josie Altador is, is 100% and is absolutely ready to go, we probably see him in the starting lineup. I haven't heard anything about his his availability from an injury point. Um, I but, can jump in to say that he, both he and Omar Gonzalez were game-time decisions for the game against New York. Obviously, neither one ended up featuring, so make of that what you will. I, I mean, I would make of that that if the, this game's on Wednesday and yeah. you're a game-time decision on what – Thursday, mm-hmm. there's no way you're 100% fit uh, on next week. Tuesday of this week, Vandy said, the guys are progressing. Omar did everything we needed him to do. Josie came in early, got his work in. He's going to see the doc, and we'll see where he's at. But everything's going to be tight. So that was in relation to the game last night. Or to Josie's ago, hamstrings. Excuse me. Yes, just like Josie's <laughs> hamstrings. So maybe with uh, a few more days, he'll be good to go. But uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, what about from the Atlanta side? I guess they have always have big selection decisions. We've talked about Pitti Martinez and Barco and mm-hmm. whether you go with Heinemann over Martinez for more defensive effort. There's also the question of Robinson. Will he be back? Parkhurst, will he be back? Joe, share, share what you know. Do you know anything about any of those situations? Miles Robinson's injury continues to be a, a problem for Atlanta. It, it, I think they're, they're not necessarily as 
aware of his ability to come back and play in this game. They, there, he's he continues to be a question mark from from everything that I understand so far. So that that definitely causes some problems. Puckhurst as well. We don't know. At least I am not aware of what his you know what the outlook on his potential availability is. So. For Atlanta, we're gonna. I think we're gonna have to see DeBoer mix and match a little bit, right? He's yeah. gonna have to put together this puzzle, and he he passed the first round, like he he made that puzzle into something that actually looks like a picture against the Union, <laughs> um, and, and that's gonna be so important in this game, regardless of whether Altidore plays or not. Um, if if he's not fully fit, we could see him even come off the bench late in the match, and then maybe that's start the MLS Cup if Toronto make it that far. But again, that's that's in the future, so it's not something that Vanny will be thinking about right now, but. The way that Atlanta manages, the way that DeBoer manages that back line is going to be absolutely key for this game because Toronto's attack is dangerous. We've seen it. We saw them turn on the Jets against DC United with those four goals in the first half of extra time in the first round. And then we saw them come out and have some dangerous chances against NYCFC as well. As well, So how Atlanta manages their their back line from an injury perspective is going to be a really big uh, metric for how this game goes. Speaking of, um, I'm going to throw this out there. Florentine Pogba? Actually, a very good defender and very good bringing the ball out of the back. And I'd be perfectly fine with him starting a playoff game if I'm an Atlanta fan. I'd almost say maybe he hasn't played enough this year, like he deserves more minutes. I, I totally agree. I don't know. I'd be lying if I said I'd paid enough attention to Atlanta throughout the season to know kind of what Pogba's deal was, why he was playing some with Atlanta United 2 and USL, all of those factors. But judging from from their Eastern Conference, the last round game against the Union, Pogba was very good. He had a sequence that sticks out in my mind where he he carried the ball forward and sort of forced the Union's midfield to to show to him to step. And then yeah. he he took advantage of a little gap and played a ball through. It was simple, but it just shows his his quality on the ball and his ability to make an offensive impact. And then defensively, he can cover ground in that left side, whether that's from I mean, more of a defensive left back or a left sided center back in a back three or just the left half of, of a defensive center back pairing. He can do all of those things. So I, I think Atlanta United have kind of found a, a really decent defensive utility player who can make an impact in these types of games. Because the thing we were worried about was the uh, the the mobility that Mars Robinson offers goes missing. But maybe, yeah, like you said, Pogba covering ground um, offers a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Robinson's impact has not been Parkhurst in the first game and then a combination of a formation shift and then LGP and and Pogba have, have sort of lessened the, the issues with Robinson not being a part of the lineup, which is not something I ever thought we'd be saying when we when this playoff started after Robinson picked up that injury with the US. That's why soccer is so exciting. All right, that game is uh, Wednesday night, um, 8 p.m. kickoff or there or thereabouts, Atlanta versus uh, Toronto. The day before, Tuesday night, uh, October 29th, 10 p.m. Eastern kickoff, it's LAFC hosting the Seattle Sounders. Here's the first tactical thing I'm interested in. Um, we saw Dallas try and deal with Seattle's uh, left side, the Brad Smith, Jordan Morris, Ladero drifting over left side uh, by having like Reggie Cannon on the right wing and a centre-back play right back. Um, we didn't talk about it, but we saw RSL sort of try and pin Brad Smith back, yeah. I would argue. Taylor made that point, mm-hmm. right? That they would send Herrera forward and try and pin Brad Smith back. And it kind of sort of worked until it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> will Bob Bradley have a plan for Seattle's left side or will it just be like LAFC go out and do what LAFC does and steamroll teams? And it finishes 14 to 13. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd watch that. <laughs> yeah. That would be a watershed moment. That'd be, that'd be okay. Yeah. I, don't know if, I don't know if it'd be a good watershed moment. <laughs> it would certainly be a moment. <laughs> We talked we talked about Latif Blessing earlier, and he does typically play in that right sided midfield mm. role, central midfield role. And so I'm I'm wondering, this is just speculation. I don't think we'll see Bradley make any systemic adjustments necessarily, but it could be just sort of a okay, Latif Blessing, you are you're the Reggie Cannon of this game, right? In the first round, we saw <laughs> Dallas Luigi Gonzalez play Reggie Cannon a little bit out of position, but you know we believe that that was with an eye to shutting down Seattle's left sided attacks with Brad Smith and, and Jordan Morris. We, we believe that that's what the intent was there to have a more defensive minded player in that spot a little higher up the field, but playing off of another fullback as well. And so Blessing could sort of take that role up playing off of Stephen Beta Shore on the right side of LAFC's defense to to try. I, I don't know that any team can can do it 100 percent, but to try to limit the effectiveness of Seattle's left sided overloads and then their attacks down that wing. So you're saying Blessing will be like LAFC's right winger or right central midfielder? Like Where are you picturing him in this setup? 
I think they'll still be in the 4 through 3 with Blessing as that that right-sided central midfielder. But if he drifts wide when when Seattle possess the ball, and maybe it'll be less of Diego Rossi or whoever that right winger is. Maybe it's Vela at that point. Maybe it'll be less of their responsibility to to contribute defensively and more Blessing partnering up with his right back and shifting a little bit wider and almost acting temporarily as that wide right midfielder, but only only to shut down those defensive moments. Got it. And here's a, an idea for Bob Bradley, who I know loves to listen to media and mm-hmm. take suggestions. <laughs> That's a favorite thing. Um, if Carlos Vela plays right wing in this game, then if I'm Brad Smith, I'm suddenly thinking, maybe I'll just stay home a little more than usual. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Yeah, if if Vela shifts a little bit wider and Diomande comes back into the lineup, that's if you're that left back, if you're Brad Smith, he's always in the back of your mind. You can't go forward without thinking about what's going to happen to you if Carlos Vela gets the ball in behind. Uh so that's that's another example of of a team using their offensive ability to to sort of act as a defensive mechanism as well. Tyler Miller uh, did not have the best game. He didn't have the worst game. He has the the bad one for Zlatan's uh, equalizing goal, then the equalizer. But then he pulls off some decent saves. How do you rank him in terms of like MLS goalkeepers? Where does he fit in? Is he a potential source of strength or is he a potential liability for LAFC? In most games, I think Tyler Miller is is a definite strength. But then when it seems like he matches up with Zlatan of the Galaxy, he sort of just melts a little bit. Which, I mean, I, I kind of feel bad for him in a sense because it's got to be a mental thing at this point. That that near post shot should have been saved. That's routine. Even though it's it's from Zlatan, it wasn't hit that hard. Uh, he had a chance to, to knock that one out. But on the whole, Miller, I think, is a definite asset for LAFC. He didn't play in some matches at the, in the home stretch of the season, but now he's, he's reestablished himself as the number one. He's back in the lineup and... Offensively and defensively, he is he is an asset for them. He can play out from the back. He's got good feet, um, and then typically he he conducts himself well in goal, helping stop some of the transition attacks maybe that that happen when LAFC push numbers forward. So on the whole, I think he's he's a definite positive for LAFC in this game against Seattle. Any other tactical previewy points that anyone wants to raise before we uh, before we move on from the conference finals, as everybody except me calls them. <laughs> I've got one more if, if yeah. you guys will indulge me. Absolutely. I think I think Victor Rodriguez's status is is definitely something that I'm going to be keeping an eye on. We saw Jovan Jones start both of these games in in a wide midfield role for Seattle so far. He started in the first round against FC Dallas and in the in the second round against Real, Real Salt Lake. Victor Rodriguez is just a flat out a better player in possession and if, if Seattle want a chance to to really cause LAFC some difficulties with their attacking play seeing whether uh, Brian Schmetzer puts him into the lineup could be a good measuring stick for how Seattle are going to approach the match. If we see Joven Jones start at right wing, maybe we, we see them play a little bit more reactively, a little bit more passive, and, and try to win the ball in transition. But if we see Victor Rodriguez go out there, it could be a sign that, that Seattle want to play with the ball and they're they're willing to go toe-to-toe with LAFC from a possession standpoint. So that's one thing that I'm going to be looking at as soon as the lineup comes out to see which of those two players is starting that could give us a little bit of a clue as to how Seattle want to approach this one. All right. Thank you for raising that, Joe. Uh, and then those games, uh, you will be hosting the, the review show here on the Total Soccer Show. Taylor's nothing right. she just remembered. I did just That's remember. right. You guys are giving me the keys. Yeah. So we're going to be, we haven't told people why, but we're going to be out of town um, mm. those days, right? We're, we're going on a bit of a trip, which will be explained explained later. So yeah, we're giving Joe um, a copy of the keys to, <laughs> to the digital version of Total Soccer Show Tower. So Joe will be hosting um, the MLS co- Conference Finals uh, Review. We, uh, we've had some suggestions for names for the, the future Joe MLS show, um, as part of the Total Soccer Show family. We're not, I'm going to say we're not quite ready to reveal the winning name just yet. We've kind of chosen it, but I'm sort of nervous to reveal it just in case we change our mind in yeah. the meantime. I mean, we can, we can go back through and make sure there's no other, like, yeah. contenders in there. We'll double check. We'll double check. But I genuinely look forward to listening to, uh, to a Total Soccer Show without me or Taylor on it. <laughs> that seems wrong. It seems yeah. so wrong. I mean, in terms of the amount of work we have to do, it seems great. Yeah, it seems great to make a flyer with it. <laughs> fair, so, enough, fair enough. So, Joe, thank you for joining us. And our listeners can look forward to hearing you once again uh, next week. But it's not the end of the show, is it, Taylor? There's a little more Total Soccer Show today. There is indeed. We've got uh, Jeff Kasouf of The Equalizer coming up next to preview the NWSL final, which is happening this weekend. But also we talk about the likely, very likely appointment of uh, Vlatko Andonovsky as the head coach of the US Women's National Team. Top pronunciation. We ta- Thank you very much. We talk NWSL best 11 and all the controversy there and a little bit of Alex Morgan slash Carly Lloyd at the very end. Oh, and who's going to the Olympics and who isn't, yes. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So here is Taylor's interview with Jeff Kasouf. 
With me now making his, I believe, return to the Total Soccer Show is Mr. Jeff Kasouf of uh, The Equalizer. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to uh, to talk some NWSL championship. I suppose I should say Equalizer Soccer, uh, but I'm, I'm used to the Equalizer podcast. There's lots of different Equalizers, Jeff. What's the best way to explain the Equalizer? Yeah, no, I'm glad you actually brought that up because I, I we do. I've tried to like make a point through the through our years here that it's the Equalizer, and obviously our domain has. Um, we couldn't get the Equalizer in a lot of different places, including URLs, because mm-hmm. Denzel Washington and his movie had taken those. So. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's EqualizerSoccer.com, which I guess is good for SEO, but the Equalizer is kind of how, you know, I always refer to it. There we are. And it covers uh, all all things women's soccer, which is what we're going to be talking today. We're going to get into into the NWSL final, which is happening this weekend. So going to talk a little bit, uh, U.S. Women's National Team coaching search, maybe a lot bit. We'll see. But I wanted to start with a not at all controversial topic. The NWSL Best 11 was announced yesterday. It's a lot of familiar faces, especially to people who paid attention to the Women's World Cup this summer. So that kind of makes sense until you remember that uh, I believe all of the two players in the Best 11 missed a massive chunk of the season due to that very World Cup. (laughs) Uh, It also somehow doesn't feature four of the five players that were shortlisted for league MVP. It has brought about some controversy, some response. Jeff, what did you make of this best 11? Yeah, I mean, it's a weird one. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how we got there, to be honest, because I thought, um, so 40% of the vote were players, 20% media, 20 were owners, GM coaches, 20% fans. So it's not even like we could, you know, I think in the past, these things like a, you know, save of the week, things like that are all fan votes. And you can say, all right, it's a popularity contest, but the players had released their own. And I mean, you could criticize that for being heavy on the courage, but there's a reason it's heavy on the courage. And mm-hmm. I thought that was a, a very respectable 11 and, and a much better representation of what happened this season than this one. So I, I don't know, wh- <clears throat> excuse me. I don't quite know where this sort of netted out because 40% players, you know, I, I think coaches, GMs kind of fall into that. I, I don't know where, um, you know, we got to the point where, with all respect to them, as you're kind of alluding to, um, we had uh, a lot of players who, you know, some who hardly played in the league that are mm-hmm. on the best 11. Yeah, I think Rose Lavelle's mother even tweeted, like, even I didn't vote for, <laughs> uh, vote for Rose. She, she started five yeah. games, I think. So who would you, who do you think is like the biggest miss or the biggest misses from this one? Who would you have liked to see included in either this best 11 or the, I guess, the second 11? Glaring problem, like, for that answer and also like a PR problem for the NWSL, which I don't know how you don't just, I guess you want the integrity of votes, but just go in and correct is like Dabinia is an MVP finalist, one mm-hmm. of five of them. And she's not even on the first or second best 11 here, which is like the, the most dissonance you could possibly have in this kind of a thing. So, um, you know, no Dabinia there. I mean, certainly I think there's people from the second, like a Yuki Nagisato that maybe, you know, you argue should bump up. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of people who aren't there at all, um, you know, I think Andy Sullivan is one for me in the mm-hmm. midfield that was very good. I don't think is necessarily, you know, wouldn't have been an MVP outrun, you know, a ballot. I, I had her because it went five deep on a ballot. And then, you know, Casey Short is probably, I'm uh, sorry, not Casey Short's on there, but um, Jalen Hinkle mm-hmm. is, is the other fullback uh, who, who's not on there. So I, I think you've got a few there that just aren't there. And then obviously um, a fair number who, um, you know, to your point about Rose and even her mom saying she didn't vote for her, um, who, who probably don't make much sense being there at all, I guess. All right. Well, from one slightly controversial topic to maybe a hopefully less controversial one, uh, Vladko Andonovsky is expected to be named head coach of the U.S. Women's National Team next week. That's what Grant Wall was reporting. That's what other sources have been saying. Uh, Jeff, are you pleased with that hire? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, of everybody that uh, was in the mix, I I think, you know, a pretty clear best option in terms of, um, you know, everything on the field, the the resume of of identifying players, of developing players. And, um, you know, I think that the the really good thing there that was done is he's done that with players in terms of making them relative nobodies that, that he's kind of discovered or said, yeah, I think that she might work at this level and we can work with her. Um, And that's, you know, the recent stuff with the Bethany Balser type of player coming out of nowhere, the NAIA versus, uh, you know, all the way back to, um, I think people forget like Erica Timrak was, was not, you know, she was on radars, but the the rookie season that Adam, what she was able to do under Ananofsky in Kansas city, um, you know, a similar type of story, but that also extended to, you know, 
Um, Ananovsky was a big part of, you know, Becky Sauerbrunn was already established and, and, you know, on the cusp of being that full-time starting rock in the back for the U S but he played a big role with, with her. And, and I think vice versa for that relationship. Um, and Lauren holiday as well, a couple of world-class players, you know, all timer types for the U S um, will sing his praises. And I, I think that's factored too, in terms of Kate Markgraf talking to players, you know, fairly regularly through this process, many of them playing for him and playing for Laura Harvey as well. But, um, you know, I think, Tactically, you know, everything, identification, uh, a really good choice for uh, a team that needs to, to continue to kind of evolve despite winning the world. Uh, so you mentioned, like, uh, tactically, he's a good hire there. I asked Meg Linehan uh, this when she was on the show last. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what do you think we should expect from him in terms of tactics and style when it comes to coaching the national team? Yeah, I think what's interesting with him and his background is, you know, he comes from before the women's game, which is, you know, six, seven years for him now, but uh, came from the youth game, certainly, but but also has this background as a pro indoor player and pro indoor coach with, you know, the MASL with the boards and everything else. So, um, you know, he's he's used to working in small spaces. And I think when you look at the U.S. team that has gotten better and evolved technically, I think you look at Rose Lavelle's introduction to, to the team regularly, obviously Tobin Heath, uh, there, there's been hints of that, and Jill Ellis kind of knew she needed that after 2016. But um, I think that that's a big thing. Obviously, the, the defensive approach um, is a big one too. But I think you look at this team and how it might evolve, you know, not only from personnel, but also how that personnel might look. Um, I think we'll see a more technical side and a team more comfortable on the ball. Which, to be fair, they've they've been working toward that in this, these past few years, but I think even more so we'll see that with the way Andonofsky likes to play. It's been a while since uh, the U.S. women's national team had a new coach, obviously. Um, I, I'm like, like on the men's side of the game, when you've got the new national team coach coming in, you tend to get a little bit of experimentation. Some players that have been on the outs are brought back in. Like there's, there's some sort of swapping to see what happens. Are you expecting something like that with Vlatko coming in, or should we expect the first few camps to be a lot of the same faces from the World Cup, from camps that we've already had in the past? Well, I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think we'll see what happens with this first camp. I mean, he's only going to be less than a week here until he's, you know, in Columbus from, from the way that that camp will work out. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, so, I mean, he's got a quick turnaround and that will be, I would assume that would be most World Cup players. I mean, there might be a, an addition or two and, you know, depending on how injuries look after these NWSL playoffs, things like that. But uh, the big thing will be December, actually, there's going to be an identification camp, which the, the, team's collective bargaining agreement requires those world cup players, those regulars to actually not go to that camp. And, and they have that as a, uh, their off time and, and is blocked out from after that November international window until the new year. So um, his first like big extensive camp without any games will be entirely non-regular U S players and evaluating them. Um, and, and those will obviously be players he's very familiar with, probably a lot of them that he's coached in Seattle and Kansas City, um, plenty of them I'm sure that he's coached against. So um, I think we'll immediately, we will immediately see those players in camp, and then that'll be, you know, from there it's, it's a matter of seeing who's going to spill into January where you've got um, a January camp that sort of has this extra importance of Olympic qualifying going right into She Believes. So I think we're going to see, you know, some experimentation, quote-unquote, just by the nature of, of having that camp. Um, and then he's got some, some tough decisions to make and, and he doesn't have to make them right away, but I mean, you know, within the next six months or so, I gotcha. think he's, he's looking at, you know, veterans and, and uh, newer players that he's got to really decide on who he might be taking to the Olympics. Well, that makes sense. Before he has to make that decision, we'll be having uh, the NWSL final, which is this weekend. Uh, North Carolina Courage hosting the Chicago Red Stars. Uh, for you, Jeff, what will be the areas of focus for both teams? Like, what are the strengths and weaknesses that each will kind of look to play into and then capitalize upon? Yeah, I mean, both teams, uh, you know, really strong in central midfield and, and two of the more narrow teams, for lack of a better term, in this league. Um, a lot of the their midfield, their concentration of talent in, in the center of the park. I mean, North Carolina plays this box midfield where they don't actually have any wide midfielders. And Chicago um, plays with, you know, kind of these hybrid wide midfielders and, and Yuki Nagasato and, and Savannah McCaskill in free roles. But similarly, 
more traditionally kind of central players with Morgan Bryant, Vanessa DiBernardo, uh, Daniel Colaprico. So I think who's going to win that center of the park battle, and there's a little bit of gamesmanship there with Rory Dame saying he may or may not have Julie Ertz at center back, maybe at in the midfield. Um, she's been playing center back most of the rest, of, you know, the late part of the season. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting. And then with that concentration on that center of the park, um, you know, could very well open up those flanks where both of these teams play with fullbacks that like to play 18, 18. Um, so I, I think those two will sort of have some, uh, you know, uh, symbiotic relationship of sorts that, that success in one might lead to success in the other. And I think, you know, either of those situations or scenarios really, um, you know, whichever fullback or fullbacks can really find that success on the flank where there might be a little space. And then, um, you know, we'll see if those central midfield kind of offset each other, or if one can kind of uh, prevail uh, among the other in, in a crowded and talented area of the pitch. Uh, and in the Courage's semifinal this past weekend, they end up winning 4-1 to one over Seattle. But it's kind of a strange one. Scoreless until very late, then 1-1 one to one heading into extra time, then it finishes 4-1. to one. Was that, in your opinion, North Carolina sort of turning it on when they needed to? Or was it Seattle more so running out of gas and North Carolina were able to exploit that? Yeah, a little bit of both. But I, I think the rain really did run out of gas. I mean, Andonofsky would tell you this. I mean, the, the talent levels, particularly given... Um, the number of injuries that the rain had, you know, they knew that the only way to win that game was to kind of sit in bunker defensive shell and, and try to play on the counter, which honestly they did really successfully for basically the 90 minutes. They gave up a PK in the 88th, I think, and then, um, you know, forced them to go forward even more and they find the equalizer in stoppage time. But um, you could see in, in extra time, they were gassed. Uh, they've had a long season, a lot of injuries uh, playing like that for 90 minutes. And then I guess playing like that for 120 minutes can really um, wear you down. And, and the courage are um, as cliche as it might be, and maybe as like American as it might be, it's, you know, they're the most fit team in the league. Um, so they, they really are a team that, you know, if you set up like that, I think in that scenario, Andonofsky and the rain gave themselves the best chance that they could do in that game. But certainly um, it's a matter of slowly wearing down and then the courage is kind of outlasting you and, you know, they put up 35 shots a game for, you know, not even really an exaggeration, but slight exaggeration. And <laughs> at some point, you know, that breaks a team down. Yeah. Uh, but North Carolina mostly able to shut down Seattle uh, over all the one goal, obviously. How do you think they can do the same thing against Sam Kerr? And I'm going to assume for North Carolina, ideally not conceding that goal uh, to Sam Kerr. I mean, I think it's going to be an interesting question of, you know, she's she loves to Sam Kerr loves to play in behind loves to run in behind and, and she will kind of check down combined with teammates but uh, I mean I was out in North Carolina training yesterday and I think there's an awareness of um, how Chicago likes to play and and that is a little bit direct um, in terms of finding her and relying on Kerr so um, I, I think part of she is, is really going to be uh, a key to that in terms of the distribution to her because uh, we've seen this year how much Sam Kerr and Yuki Nagasato feed off of each other. And, and Yuki Nagasato likes to drop into a slightly deeper space, um, almost in kind of like a hybrid 10 role. And, and she, if you allow her to turn, pick her head up and find Kerr, whether that's on the counter or in the run of play, um, you know, the Thorns saw that in the summer. Gordon finds Nagasato and she picks her head up and, and just threads a beautiful ball in behind the Kerr, um, you know, really from nothing. It was just a counterattack. So uh, I think stopping that distribution in the midfield is actually a big part of it because if you can cut off service to her, um, I don't want to say she's not going to beat you one-on-one -on -one because she's very talented and, and good, but uh, that's, that's a big piece of how Chicago plays is actually finding her in space and behind. So um, I think it's, it's a little combination of maybe dropping off to kind of account for that and not have to get in a foot raise with her, but also trying to kind of suffocate that midfield from actually having the time to pick their heads up and find her. Hmm. 
All right. So uh, I look forward to finding out what happens. I'm sure people can read more about uh, this game from you, both before and after. But before I let you go, I wanted to ask you one more question. Uh, Alex Morgan and Servando Carrasco announced they're expecting their first child, which uh, I'm assuming, based on science, uh, means Morgan will miss the Olympics next summer. Uh, do you think that reopens the door for Carly Lloyd to potentially start in the Olympics? Or are you, are you expecting other players to maybe challenge for that uh, vacancy? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's a combination of, of both really. And, and certainly it's a, uh, it's a pretty wide open question at this point, because mm-hmm. it, it really matters what, you know, who Vlatko Andonovsky rates and, and certainly how he rates Carly Lloyd in this situation. And, and that's a conversation they'll have to have. But also he's very familiar with this, this NWSL pool, which has plenty of options at forward. Um, and, and I'd be curious even, you know, um, how does he rate a Kristen Press as a number nine, which is, really her natural position that a lot of us have been yelling for years. Um, and she's kind of been forced in these wide areas. So even internally, I think, you know, internally being from this 23 from the world cup, there's a lot of options there. Um, and we'll see, I mean, I know, you know, Morgan, I've seen reports that she wants to try to be back for the Olympics. She's due to give birth in April, which is a, a really tight timeline, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, I think anything's possible given how, how wide open this is. And I think he'll, he'll probably shake a few things up, whether it's number nine or not. We'll see. All right. Well, Jeff Kasuf, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got to get to media day. You've got lots of work to do. If people want to hear more from you or read more of your work, how can they do so? How can they find you? Yeah. Um, follow us on the social channels, Equalizer Soccer. I'm Jeff Kasuf, K-A-S-S-O-U-F. And then um, everything we write is the EqualizerSoccer.com. And I would implore you to subscribe to our premium content. We've got a 40% off coupon with the word champion for your first year of annual. So um, that's that's how you can get everything and kind of the the first scoops on a lot of stuff. And then you all do employ Denzel Washington? I just want to get that clear one more time. <laughs> uh, we'd be welcome to have, you know, we'd love to have his services <laughs> if he would be so inclined to join. All right. Well, uh, Denzel, the offer's out there. Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, I hope the, uh, the rest of the weekend goes smoothly. Yeah, thank you.